So the next next talk will be given by Eike Kilt, and it's about identity-based lossy treptor functions. Okay, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so it's uh, identity-based lossy treptor functions and applications, which Mark forgot to mention. So it's joint work with uh, Mihir Balari from UCSD, uh, Chris Pikert from Georgia Tech, and Ben Waters from from Austin. Okay, so so instead of you know, presenting a new tool and then, you know, as, as, as the previous talk and then maybe you're focusing on the applications, what you do, I want to present you a new tool and maybe not too much focus on the application. I really want to present you a new tool, which I think uh, is interesting by its uh, uh, own right, and that's going to be identity-based uh, uh, trapdoor functions, which sometimes are lossy and sometimes are not. Okay, so let me remind you what is a, um, a trapdoor function or trapdoor permutation, as Dennis already did. So what we have, we have a, we have an, first we want, we need injective trapdoor functions. What we have, we have the function f, which is uh, indexed by a public key. Okay, it was the index in, uh, in Dennis' talk. Slightly different notation. So it's a function that maps in uh, strings from 0, 1 to the n to uh, some range, okay? And of course, we want that um, it's hard to invert so it's one way, it's hard to invert. So f, computing f to the minus one is hard in general, but of course, if you want to know a secret key, a trapdoor, uh, it's easy, okay? And there you know, are examples are this uh, famous RSA scheme from uh, 78, and you know, ever since, no, uh, some time ago, um, well, this has emerged as one of the most fundamental primitives in crypto. And in particular, we can do a lot of things from it. We can do uh, whatever, uh, signatures, uh, encryption, the whole world in, in cryptomania from, from Russell's uh, specifications. And one interesting thing is to note that um, first came a trapdoor or function, and then six years later in GM84, um, um, there was only the concept of uh, you know, probabilistic encryption. Okay, so first trapdoor functions, then encryption, six years later. Okay, so what are security notions for uh, a trapdoor function? So the most simple one is the traditional one is one winner. So given you know, a public key, in a, uh, uh, um, which is generated using a key generation algorithm, it outputs also a trapdoor, but that's not given to the adversary. So given this green public key and f of x, it's hard to recompute x for randomly chosen x. That's one minus. No, it's all well known. So then, as Dennis already explained, there's also the lossiness that's induced by Pike and Waters at, uh, in 0, 0.8. So what they require, so it's, it's again, it's a trapdoor function, but we require additional security requirement. We require that there exists an alternative G generation algorithm that outputs a fake public key, so my fake public key is always red, such that first of all, it's indistinguishable from real public key, and second, the range of the function is smaller, much smaller than the pre-image size. So if you want, there's an image, so in the lossy mode, um, the public key, actually, the range is much, much smaller than 2 to the n. So that's the lossy trapdoor function. Okay? And, uh, you know, it has a couple of implementations. So it implies, of course, it's one minus, no? because once you switch to the lossy mode, you know, um, there's no, not inf information left of f of x to recompute x. So you can easily show that it implies one minus. It also implies collision resistant Hessian, um, but it also applies in a couple of advanced primitives. Um, such that CC is secure encryption, selective opening security, domestic encryption, and uh, hatched encryption. Um, there are constructions known from DDH, QR, PAYE, RSA, LWE, and the, and the phi hiding assumptions. A bunch of constructions are known. Okay, so what's the context of, uh, of our paper? So we show a couple of things. Actually, it has a lot of results, a lot of small results as well. So first of all, we, you know, we look at um, chapter functions in the identity-based framework explain that in a second. Okay, so first of all, we give definitions, and that's, you know, most of my talk will actually focus on definitions, so it's somehow non-trivial to define these, uh, these objects. Um, applications, I'll, you know, quickly mention the applications of identity-based lost chapter functions. Um, and then, I, you know, I'll give you some, you know, two slides I have about constructions, but since it's, like, super complicated and it's, uh, you know, a 20-page construction now paper, uh, I will only give you the high-level idea. And we have two constructions, actually, one from bilinear maps from pairings, and the other one is from lattices. And the you know, lattice construction I not mentioned at all, but the bilinear construction I you know, give some, some idea. Okay, so let me remind you what is identity-based encryption, okay? So identity-based encryption formally, so the idea is that you want to simplify the uh, PK, PKI um, such that every public key gives raise to one, every public key together with an entity 
gives rise to an uh, encryption function. That means people don't have to generate their own public key secret key, put, put the public key into the PKI, um, just use the master public key and an identity encryption. So more formally, so this consists of the following algorithm, so first of all, key generation algorithm, and then an encryption algorithm that inserts the public key, the master public key, and an identity in a message, and outputs a ciphertext. And that works for all identities for an exponential large set of identities. Okay, and then the other thing is that yeah, there's some sort of abstract algorithm that inputs the secret key here in an entity and outputs the secret key, the trapdoor, which is used to reconstruct the ciphertext using the decryption algorithm. Okay, so gen eng extract such that decryption and decryption yields the identity for all entities. Um, historically, this concept was proposed by Xiaomi in 84 but uh, only uh, 20 years later, there was actually a you know, accurate security definition and there were a couple of constructions in these years. Um, you know, once this uh, concept was proposed, um, a lot of other uh, ID-based uh, uh, objects were also considered, including ID-based signatures, which were already proposed by Shamir, and uh, some other ID-based blind signatures. You can do everything ID-based if you want. There's a bunch of papers on these things. Okay, so now I'm going to define you what is an ID-based uh, uh, trapdoor function. Let me switch back and forth maybe two or two, three times. You can see what's changing, nothing much. Changing is the, you know, the you know, encryption algorithm and the inversion algorithm here. Okay, so what we have, this is the ID-based trapdoor function. So we have generate, evaluation, extract, and invert. So the thing that changed again is encryption is now evaluation. So what do we have? We have for each identity here, we, uh, the evaluation algorithm, um, implies a function which is indexed by all these identities, which goes from 0, 1 to the n to r. So here's the picture, okay? So each identity, so if the public key implies for each of these identities a function that goes from 0, 1 to the n into the range, okay? For exponential. So one public key specifies exponentially many uh, functions. And what is uh, new is that there's also um, an extract algorithm, again, no? That uh, implies once you have the secret key, then you actually can do the inversion, okay? So once you have the secret key, you can go back from the range um, to, uh, to, the, to uh, zero and to the end, okay, for a specific identity. Okay, so that's the definition. Um, right, so I want to sort of, uh, you know, say one thing that I think that, or they think that is a, a sort of a natural object to look at. Um, in particular, if you look at the history, um, in, in the normal public key setting, there was the trapdoor function six years before the encryption, and in the identity-based framework, it was somehow reversed, because we made all this post, um, progress in, in, in you know, thinking how, how cryptography works, and at some point we realized maybe encryption is a bit more important than, uh, than trapdoor functions, but uh, we sort of forgot that trapdoor function is actually the most fundamental object and implies a lot of things. What we do here, so if we correct history and you know, we, we look at uh, 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 the most natural thing actually in the identity-based framework that you know, over the last couple of years, it's now 10 years since the uh, Bonnie Franklin encryption scheme has, uh, you know, been overlooked. Okay, so how about security? So intuitively, to find security of uh, an ID-based trapdoor function, um, we want that the function indexed by some challenge identity is secure, it's one way or lossy, whatever you want, um, even given the user secret key for many other identities. So that's what we want to capture. And then there are sort of two dimensions where we can, um, we can consider. We can first consider security, so which can be one-wayness or lossiness, lossiness stronger. And then we can sort of specify um, how the adversary selects the uh, challenge identity. And that's usually, um, it's distinguished between selective and uh, adaptive. And then you get these four notions here. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, you know, I give you the definition of uh, one-wayness in the selective uh, um, setting. So how does it work? So the experiment is written here, and uh, here is an adversary, okay? Adversary plays against the experiment. So first of all, the adversary has to choose as a, um, a challenge identity, has to commit that, okay? Gives that to uh, the experiment, the experiment uh, computes a public key and a secret key pair and gives the public key to the adversary, okay? Now the adversary can make a couple of uh, ID queries and get the user secret key for this identity. Okay, and then finally, um, the experiment chooses a random x and challenges, so evaluates the trapdoor function on, um, on id star on x. Okay, so you get, f, you get f id star of x, and uh, you know, the experiment 
uh, outputs win if x equals x prime, x prime being returned by this. So if the adversary is able to um, you know, compute this x here. So that's one minus. Okay, we defined it one minus as the probability the adversary wins is uh, sort of negligible. So that, there everything sort of makes sense and it's easy. Um, in the selective setting, um, we want that the identity is then selectively or adaptively chosen um, 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 before the challenge is established. Okay, we can do that, and that also makes sense. So we just say, you know, instead of um, committing it in the beginning, the adversary says, okay, um, you know, I, I, after I've seen a couple of user secret keys, I want to get challenged on this particular identity, id star, then f id star of x is challenged, and the adversary again wins if we can compute the right x. Okay, so again, one minus in the adaptive setting is also sort of easy and intu intuitive to uh, define. Okay, so if you get to lossiness, things get a little bit uh, more uh, difficult, okay? Um, in the selective setting, it's still okay. In the adaptive setting, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. Okay, selective lossiness, again, an adversary uh, in beginning uh, uh, commits to a challenge identity, id star, um, you know, gets the public key, and now, it has to, in the end, it has to distinguish between the green public key and the red public key. The green public key is going to be the injective public key, meaning that all the uh, Thrapter functions for all identities are going to be injective, invertible. Okay? And the red public key sort of is some sort of lossy public key. And of course, we want that it's lossy on this ID star identity, you know, the one that uh, the adversary chose to be uh, challenged on in the, in the end. Okay? And then everything uh, sort of pops up more or less naturally. So again, the adversary can make a couple of identity queries. And, uh, and you know, outputs a bit, and you define it as lossy if the adversary cannot distinguish these things, and in the red case, actually, the range of the ID star uh, function is small, is lossy, okay? And if you want a picture, it's actually similar to Dennis' picture, but I you know, can't draw graphics as nice as he can, so, if, so that is the identity space, it's the set of all identities, so then actually we require that the public key that the adversary in the, in the red case outputs here sort of gives a punctured identity space. So the green ones are all injective, okay? But the red one here is, the, that's the, the challenge identity and that's required to be lossy, okay? And of course, in the security experiment, the, you know, the public key can actually depend on this identity ID star here because that's what the adversary committed to. So there everything sort of works fine and still, so that, that security definition is still sort of natural. Okay, now comes the, um, the adaptive case and that's gonna be less natural. Okay, so let's try to uh, define adaptive settings. So that means that entity ID star moves down here. Okay, and then sort of, okay, so then in the lossy case, we cannot make the, um, the public key generation depending, dependent on ID star anymore. Okay, so what does it mean? What does it mean here? So, we, so sort of if you consider this uh, set of all identities here, so, uh, in, so that is well-defined once the public key is output, that it's well-defined if a particular identity is lossy or not. Okay. So we cannot make this definition anymore because um, an adversary has to query uh, these identities here and it has to get the user secret key back, okay? So you know, if, if you sort of make some uh, identities losses and, and some not, the adversary may be able to notice because you can query some identities and maybe you know, the user secret key doesn't exist so the, um, so the adversary may notice that we are in the in the, in the lossy case and will say, okay, I, I, I don't want to distinguish, okay? So this security definition doesn't make any sense anymore in the adaptive setting and it's absolutely not clear how to define it. So what we propose in, this, in the paper is a relaxation of, uh, of, uh, of this notion. So what our intuition is, is the same. Again, this is a similar image that Dennis uh, drew with a, you know, with a with a, um, with a lattice, I, you know, I can't draw it like, nice like that, but I, you know, this is a, a fraction of lossy identities. So what we, what we are require from the, um, from the public key that it's sort of in a, in a state between lossy and, and non-lossy. The lossy identities are the red ones and the um, non-lossy identities are the green ones, okay? And uh, so now we need a sort of a relaxation factor. Um, we want that this set of all identities contains a defraction of, um, of lost identities, and this defraction has to be hidden, okay? And this is the, the security mission that we define, so we do a scaling factor here, so we define D-lossiness for a scaling parameter, such that the probability, so D times the probability that uh, the adversary outputs one on the public key, on the real public key, minus the probability that outputs one on the red public key, on the lossy public key, um, and the challenge identity is really lossy, that has to be negligible, 
okay? The former definition was, okay, the D is just one, but we just saw that this is not fulfillable. Actually, there's an attack against it, and, but we can relax it. And our hope is that we can still first instantiate and second, it actually makes sense, okay? And that's we, what we show in the paper, the implications of uh, IDB's lossy trapdoor function as follows. First, in the selective uh, setting, um, we show that uh, uh, implies one minus actually. Uh, in, it in also implies the domestic and uh, hatched identity-based encryption. So I should say a, a few words about what it is, maybe. Um, the domestic identity-based encryption is, uh, so suppose the message you want, so suppose you want to make an uh, encryption function um, deterministic. So we all know from our Crypto 1 lecture, for the first lecture that we had in crypto, that this is actually impossible. We cannot, uh, it doesn't fulfill in CPI security, okay? But suppose the message actually has some entropy, okay? And this is what deterministic encryption does. It gets the highest possible security notion if, um, if you assume that the message is, uh, has some entropy, and then um, we can actually use a deterministic encryption function, okay? So um, we show that identity-based, lossy chapter function actually imply deterministic identity-based encryption, okay? And it also implies something else, which we call hatched identity-based encryption, which is only known to be uh, doable in the public key setting. Hatched um, identity-based encryption is that when you um, have sort of a bad randomness when encrypting, then still there's still some sort of security guarantee. Um, that's still the, you get some sort of uh, in CPA security, even though there's some leakage about the randomness that's hatched. Uh, and it based encryption. Okay, in the adaptive uh, setting, we show that if the scaling factor D is more or less one over a polynomial, okay? So one was, again, not achievable, but it's one over a polynomial. If the fraction of uh, lossy identities is one over a polynomial, um, then actually implies a, a one minus in the adaptive setting. What we can't show yet um, is if it implies identity-based encryption or not, but it cannot deterministic or hatched identity-based encryption in the adaptive setting. That's an open problem. Okay, so let me say uh, a, a, a few words about the constructions of these uh, identity-based lossy chapter functions. Um, so first about the difficulty. So if you look at IBE, IBE is, the encryption function is probabilistic and that makes things much more easy. But here you can use some sort of Diffie-Hellman kind of uh, you know, inherently uh, randomized encryption function. On the other hand, lossy chapter function, you know, each function is actually a function, so it's inherently deterministic. Okay, so that's the difficulty, the dimension where the probabilism. Um, one thing in the random arc model is actually easy to construct these objects. Just uh, define f id of x is the you know, IB encryption under some identity, and then just use the, um, a, a random oracle um, and uh, you know derive uh, the randomness from the um, from the value x. And I can prove that this is actually a Lebesgue lossy chapter function, but in the random arc model. The standard model. It's a little bit more difficult. Okay, so the first construction is based on pairings. Um, and here's the idea. So it's very, you know, very high level idea. I'm not gonna go into any details because the schemes are really complicated. Okay, so we start from an anonymous IBE scheme, which anonymous means that the ciphertext hide the identities. Okay, okay, so there's actually one scheme, which is by uh, 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 Boyan and Waters from uh, 06. So we tried that first. It seems to be a natural candidate with our uh, intuition, but it didn't work out. So we need to, needed to modify it because we need some sort of more homomorphic properties later. Okay, so actually on the way, we found a new construction of an uh, anonymous IBE scheme um, from the linear assumption, which is actually more efficient than the original uh, Bo uh, Boyan water scheme. So it has uh, four elements in the ciphertext instead of five or six, I don't know, which we found actually surprising because we thought that some other uh, system was optimal. Okay. So, in order to construct from this anonymous IBE scheme an IDB's lost chapter function, we use the homomorphic properties of this uh, um, anonymous IBE scheme. And that's sort of similar to the construction Dennis had. You remember the Payet construction and also the DDH construction, where you sort of multiply things together in a homomorphic way, and then something, sometimes things cancel out and sometimes things don't cancel out. Okay, so here's uh, a little bit more details. Again, an eBay's lossy chapter function has, you know, two settings, an injective public key and a lossy public key, and this is the way it works. So first of all, a key generation outputs a public key and a secret key. The master public key contains the matrix of uh, a, a bunch of these, you know, magic IBE and uh, ciphertext. 
okay? And public keys, of course, okay? And the evaluation is, so evaluate this uh, loss adapter function on this uh, identity ID is a function that maps bit strings into you know, a bunch of group elements. And, you know, not gonna go into details, just the intuition is that uh, it outputs this element here, C3, C3 and C4 are vectors such that C1, C2, together with the ith component of this C3 and the ith component of uh, C4 is actually a valid encryption of uh, the underlying anonymous IBE scheme under the identity ID and, uh, and encrypts the ith bit of X, of, X of the um, input here. Okay, and the way you do it, and again, I'm not gonna go in much into details, but you sort of multiply things together in a linear way, and then the exponent things will sort of, you know, cancel out or not, and this is the way it works. Of course, once you have that, you just, you know, the user secret key of our trapped database tractor function can just be the user secret key of the underlying IV scheme, and then you can actually um, um, invert things, because these are all bits, and they can output everything. Okay, in the lossy settings, so now I have to show you how the, lossy um, 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 public keys generated. How do we do that? So actually the key generation out output outputs some sort of controlling function um, with little f and Dennis talk. Um, it goes from zero one to the n, identity space into zp. Okay. It's such that if um, the, the, so this, this controlling function f is sort of um, hidden in the, in the public key. Okay, such that um, if um, the identity, so the um, function is, uh, is evaluated in some um, value x such that this is actually a valid encryption again, a, a valid execution if this controlling function is non-equal zero. On the other hand, if it's zero, then actually this, this, the, the encryption here is independent of the, of, uh, of the x here, okay? So it doesn't contain any information anymore about the x, okay? So this magic controlling function sort of, if it's zero, um, it, is, it makes it everything lossy, okay? And the security we get by anonymity of the uh, underlying IBE scheme because the intuition that the public key, right, which some contains some information about the F here, hides F because the IBE scheme is anonymous. Okay? So let me say two words about this uh, uh, controlling function F. Um, in the selective lossy case, we just define the controlling function F as ID minus ID star. It has to be a linear function, sort of. So, um, f of id is invertible if and only if f uh, of id star, um, yeah, if f of id is non equal zero, and this is the case if and only if id doesn't equal id star, so then we actually have this scenario here exactly what we want. So in the challenge identity here, the red dot is lossy, so this thing is zero, um, so it loses information on x, so there we are fine. In the adaptive setting, it's a little bit more difficult, um, and what we do, what? Yeah, I'm finished, that's good, that's finished. Okay, in the lossy case, we use some uh, Bernoulli distribution in order to mimic this um, uh, setting here. Okay, one thing about the lattice, lattice construction, actually what we show, which is actually interesting, is that the LDB function is uh, a lossy trapdoor function, which came to me as a surprise to Chris, it was folklore, um, under the LDB function, which may be useful in other contexts as well. And uh, in order to do a lossy trapdoor function, we use the key ligation of uh, some known techniques. Okay. And that's about it. So uh, in the summary, so we gave, uh, you know, proposed the concept of V-based trapdoor functions. We gave, a we gave a couple of security definitions, showed some applications. The constructions are actually quite complicated, so I only gave a, um, a, a small overview. And if you want to have uh, details, it's on uh, ePrint, and uh, now I'm finished. Thank you. Any quick questions? If not, then let's thank Ike again.